last year, so 61 now since the Act of Parliament uh, created it. It's got about 3,000 members and as many of those are family members, but we reckon there's probably about 6,000 members altogether of the National Trust. The National Trust of South Australia is a separate organisation. Each of the National Trusts in the different states are separate organisations. They have a, a council that enables them to meet together, but they're all independently created and they all have their special character. South Australia is by far the most complex of the National Trusts of Australia. Um, we look after more properties than any National Trust outside the United Kingdom, that's in South Australia. We look after more properties, 130, than all the rest of the National Trusts in Australia put together. We have 46 branches who are part of our governance structure, as they aren't in any other national trust except the Northern Territory. And that's more branches than all the other national trusts of uh, Australia put together. <coughs> uh, those, those branches are scattered everywhere. The, the furthest west is Seduna, and the furthest to the east, to the south, is, is Mount Gambier. The distance from Seduna to Mount Gambia is about the same as the distance from London to Berlin. So it's not just a complicated organization, it's very much a far-flung organization and really has taken on a huge brief to look after all kinds of heritage, cultural, natural, and Aboriginal, which is the only body with such a broad brief <coughs> in the state. It was the case <clears throat> in 1991 that the Council of the National Trust was so convinced that local government and state government were doing such a fine job of identifying and protecting heritage that our job there was done. So we closed the register and stopped registering places. Um, but um, six years ago, seeing some writing on the wall, We've opened it again and started classifying places. We were particularly alarmed by the representations we received, not only from the Adelaide City Council, but from councillors of other inner suburban councils, um, complaining that they had put thousands and tens of thousands of dollars into heritage studies and nominated places for added protection and addition to their local registers only to find that at the level of the Minister for Planning, they were knocked back for sometimes no reason at all. So that's really the reason uh, we reopened the register. And uh, we're in the process of making it available to everyone. This has been a really, really, really big job uh, because we don't know, we didn't know when we started this, how many of those 3,000 places uh, still exist. Um, we didn't know what their condition was. In many cases, we didn't know their geographical position. Um, there were no, it, there, some of them say 10 miles to the west of um, Sudan. Well, and so what is it? Um, and so gradually we're in the process of verifying all this. But the end point of this, and it's coming very soon, will be that you will be able to go to the web, go online, and see our entire register with the geographical coordinates now put in, and with the original files dating back to the 70s and early 1980s available for you to inspect as well. Um, we had very much hope that someone either at the state or national level would take up the challenge of a unified ledger for historic places so that you could go to one single website and find every place, whether it was state listed or locally listed or listed by the National Trust. Well, that hasn't happened, so we're going to do it ourselves. Um, when we finish verifying our own register, we're then going to open the portal and connect it to the State Heritage 
registers and to the local heritage uh, registers. This may all suggest, and it probably does suggest quite rightly, that we anticipate some bumpy times ahead in, in relation to heritage preservation, which is a shame because um, for the last 44 years, South Australia could, for a lot of that time, rightly claim to be a national leader in heritage protection and preservation. Um, somehow the heart went out of government sometime in the 1990s. In the meantime, we have these properties to look after, and I'll just remind you of some of them. Beaumont House, our headquarters, <coughs> um, bequeathed to the National Trust, it was former home of Sir Samuel Davenport, who was a patron, well, he was a committed member of this society, but practically every other society in town as well, and a pioneer of agriculture. The olive groves that he planted at this house are um, the oldest or equal to the oldest in South Australia. And uh, our plan is to uh, prune them back and get them into production again, making National Trust olive oil, as we do in another property of ours. We have Ayers House. We've been, we, have, we have that part of the Ayers House on a peppercorn lease. We don't actually own it. State government owns it. Um, and uh, we just tried to renew the lease and they gave us a year, so mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't know whether that's ominous or not. But um, we had a very big exhibition there in November, December, uh, into January, and uh, over 30,000 people came, uh, more people than had come to Ayers House in the previous 20 years. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was Mr. Schiff. <coughs> the other part of our olive operation is Olive Wood in the Riverland in Renmark. And they did a very good job of burning back and coming from getting their historic olives back into production. And they make a significant amount of money every year out of it. We own it. We own Collin Grove, the historic Angus um, property. At uh, just outside Angerston near Yolamba Wines. We got plans for that. We own a l or look after a lot more of Borough uh, than probably we ought to be doing. Uh, it's just such a historic place, and there are so many buildings, and the population is so small compared to the challenge of keeping these places going. Um, I'll come back to that later and uh, the historic Redworth Jail, named in movies. We own a pub. <laughs> the Overland Corner Pub, which was a ruin when the National Trust took up the challenge of doing it in the 1980s and is now a going concern. And we hope it will go and go. Um, we're very proud of the various things we own. And the National Trust actually owns a mine. We own a mine in Borough, the Bon Accord mine. It, it never produced any copper, it produced water. But that was for a while the town's uh, water supply. So <clears throat> somehow we have to balance all these competing interests. We have quite a lot of nature reserves. Um, Will Bahangaloo in the Riverland is about 92 hectares of significant riverside uh, cliff property. Um, Englebrook up uh, in the hills, um, just outside Stirling. It's a very steep, little known reserve, but wonderful in its biodiversity. Rochdale Reserve got burnt out in the big fire of January uh, 18 months ago. Um, but uh, the regeneration is underway. Um, and because fire is a part of the environment and the landscape. <clears throat> we accept that, we don't regret it. We watch and record, uh, with the help of the volunteers, the regeneration process. And, uh, Langley Reserve at Manham and many others, many others. That, that, in fact, the first property that the National Trust ever acquired, and that was in 1956, was a nature reserve that um, 
a particular individual bequeathed to us. Now, now to some of the current controversies. Um, there is a, um, a government body that used to be known as the Land Commission, that now, for reasons that escape me, seeing what it does, is known as Renewal SA. Yes. <laughs> as far as I can see, they consider their main mission is to flog off whatever they can. And um, this got us involved first in Fort Logs. Um, Fort Logs is an extremely significant military site. It's one of eight forts in Australia that were the result of um, Sir William Gervais' uh, commission to examine the defenses of Australia in 1879 when the Russian threat was in everybody's foreground of people's minds. <clears throat> All the others except for Fort Logs are government parks, national parks, or special reserves. This one alone passed it passed to the, into the hands of the police academy. Became part of the police academy um, in the 19... 60s, and then when the police academy wanted a new building, they said, well, we'll pay for that by selling off Fort Logs. And they just advertised it for sale. For sale, Fort Logs, and this many hectares of land. Now, with no interest in taking this over, our sole interest in this point of our campaign was to keep it in public ownership mm -hmm. so that it would stay open to the public. Um, so I dressed up in a funny hat <coughs> and got into an armored vehicle and we had people with placards and waving and we had some television coverage. Um, we didn't know what this, the start was. We had absolutely zero impact on Renewal SA, let me tell you. Um, they did not want to talk to us. They did not respond to our letters, uh, uh, nothing. But then so they went ahead and put it out to tender. Um, so, one of the tenderers came to see us and said, look, we're developers, not preservationists. Um, would you like to come on board and be part of it? You do the fort, we'll do the development, and we'll get some money to pay for doing this up. And so um, instead of um, picking up our bag of marbles and going home, when we lost the campaign, we stayed and talked to the people there. And the result of that, you may have seen uh, last month, is that uh, that developer, A.V. Jennings, has got the commission to redevelop the, the site. And they have appointed us to take care and do the design for the rehabilitation of the fort. And we have been assured there will be not one, but more than one million dollars to carry out this work and enable it to be maintained on a long-term basis. Um, I never counted chickens um, ahead of the day, um, and I don't know what will eventuate, but it looks good at this stage, more than we thought we would get. Another one, same process. All of the Glenside um, former mental facility <coughs> in, in Glenside was um, earmarked for adaptive reuse. Much of it went to the film corporation. The historic buildings and new studios were built. A small portion of the land reserved for continuing accommodation of people with mental health issues. Uh, <clears throat> part of it, you may have read in the papers, uh, which included the historic Art Deco former nurses building there, uh, nurses quarters, just uh, demolished and cleared, and it's now put out to tender for a thousand residential units. But one part of the whole thing stood alone. This Zed Ward, formerly uh, once known as the, the, the ward for the criminally insane, uh, had been attached to a neighboring property that um, was used to store mine core samples. Um, the government just preserves these. Anybody who drills a hole has a, a mining tenement has to deposit their cores there. And so the old ward was used for the storage of these cores. 
Um, it was then decided by a renewal assay to flog it off. Um, we said, well, let's do two things. Let's not sell it. Uh, let's, let's make sure at least that the uh, Z ward is kept open to the public or reopened to the public because lots of people didn't know it was there. And, and you can see it's the most magnificent polychrome um, brick structure. There's, there are things of this caliber of aesthetic achievement in Victoria, but none other, nothing like this in South Australia, just really a most significant place. This always state heritage listed, but anyway, this renewal essay refused to excise Z Ward from the whole land property. It was sold, and uh, the buyer was next door beach patrolling. They wanted that land. They didn't necessarily want this, but they had to take it in, in order to get to the land. So once again, instead of crying the tears that we, we felt we were entitled to, to cry, we, we went and talked to Beach Petroleum. We said, well, what are you going to do with this? And they said, well, we're going to build wonderful new offices. And we're going to, we commissioned an, an architect, and this is all underway. And said, well, that won't stop for a while, will it? And they said, no, no, we can't start it straight away. Um, so, well, could we just let run some tours, let people see what this place is about? So, we made a small announcement that uh, Z Ward would be open to the public on a certain day in October uh, last year. And 7,000 people <laughs> showed up. <laughs> the, 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 the queue snaked out <laughs> down Kensington Road. It couldn't get them through in the time available. And so we then did it the same thing on subsequent ones. Uh, at this time, at this particular point, the price of oil and natural gas went like this. And we could see the beach petroleum was no longer going to be building anything. <laughs> Not in the short term anyway. And said, can we lease it for nothing? Um, and they said, fine, for a year, and then they've just renewed it, the lease, for another year. And all sorts of things are going on there now. Believe it or not, somebody's booked this room for a fancy society banquet. <laughs> you say, that's insane, and that must have been on their mind. <laughs> uh, a woman who does Alison Osborne, who was active in our campaign, she does ghost tours. Um, and she does a ghost tour. <laughs> with that ominous looking black and white photo as, as a come on and people go in and listen for psychic disturbances from beyond. <laughs> uh, and that's, these have been very successful. In fact, we make quite a lot of money out of these, these tours of um, Z Ward. Then along came Mondale Hall. Um, uh, Everybody knows it. <laughs> Everybody who was of an age to watch movies in 1975 saw, saw a picnic at Hanging Rock. And if they didn't know about Martindale Hall before, they certainly did then. Um, the National Trust has always had a kind of association with Martindale Hall in that we'd have volunteers who would conduct tours there. But it was never given to us. The Mortlock family, uh, who were childless, uh, gave it to the University of Adelaide for us an agricultural experiment center. The University of Adelaide took the land that they wanted, um, sold that to fund the Wade Institute, which is a worthy cause. Well, nothing against that, but um, <clears throat> they wanted to sell some more, but there was a conservation issue there. Um, but if it was in government hands, they would be able to subdivide the property and sell a bit more of it. So, with great folder all, um, the university handed Mondale Hall for nothing, so to speak, to the government of South Australia. There's a plaque up there with John Bannon's name on it as Premier, saying that we, he accepted the gift of Mondale Hall on behalf of all the people of South Australia. Well, the government has never been a good steward of 
buildings, especially historic buildings, but other buildings too, for reasons that I've never understood. Um, and they announced um, nearly two years ago that as the Department of the Environment was losing about $100,000 a year, that was the round figure they always used um, on Martindale Hall, that um, they would have to get rid of it and they were looking for expressions of interest. Um, well, there is an unsolicited bid process. Um, and if you put in an unsolicited bid and you're allowed to do it, you have 90 days. Um, and time ticked by, and the 90 days expired, and they no longer had exclusive rights to do it. So we said, what's going on? They said, well, if you want to know what's going on, you can see such and such as in the minister's office, who will give you some information. Or, if you're serious, you can put in your own unsolicited <coughs> So at that stage, we swallowed and actually spent some money. This is where the financial stability comes in handy. Um, we got a legal opinions and other things. We got a, an unsolicited bid together and put that in in January and waited for the response within our 90 days period. <laughs> and nothing's happened. No, nothing's happened. We don't know what's going on. So meanwhile, we kept up the pressure and uh, got Anne Lambert, who starred as Miranda in the Picnic at Hanging Rock. She lives in Sydney. She's now a, only a very part-time actress and a, more or less a full-time psychotherapist. Um, she would have been useful with Zed Ward too. But <laughs> she very kindly came out and got us front page coverage in the advertiser and page three coverage in the um, Australia, and we're just keeping up this publicity campaign in the hopes that something will happen. But if we're lucky, it may come to us, and we've got plans. Um, but more about those later. I'm conscious, uh, because of affiliations with geography as well as history, that I better get on to something. Uh, to this end, um, we, got, we got ourselves involved in trying to promote the concept of heritage tourism <clears throat> um, as a way not only of getting places that we have associations with or our branches have associations with <clears throat> better understood and appreciated by the public. We did two things in this report. We did, because we were asked to do it, we did a number of trails that basically could be done within the Adelaide City Council area. We'd already been doing this sort of thing. There's, there, there's a website you can visit called Adelaide City Explorer, developed by the National Trust. And if you want to click on a particular place or a kind of trail, you can follow that and see the places and click on anything and get information about it. Um, this uh, information revolution has been such a boom to the National Trust, because things that would have been impossible to do by paper or publication, we can do with technology at very little cost. <clears throat> so these are the trails that we developed as a just pilot project and wrote the book about them. And I'll just give you an example of how we approached the last one, the historic streets of North Adelaide. North Adelaide is an extremely interesting inner city area. Um, of all the inner city areas of all the cities, capital cities in Australia, North Adelaide is probably the only one that never had a period down in the dumps. Um, and yet, it was always a place where people of different social classes lived side by side. Um, a, um, a workman, an artisan who lived in North Adelaide, did a sketch map showing where different kinds of people lived. Wealthy people, mainly shopkeepers, skilled trades, unskilled trades, and located them on the map. So what he did was a piece of social geography for the time. And his map, for 100 years, remained a pretty 
true picture of the social geography of that part of the city. On the broad streets that ran, that were high and ran east-west, people built substantial houses and even some very fine mansions. And anything that fronted the park lanes got fine houses and mansions. Little lanes that ran north-south got very humble cottages um, and remain so. It's, um, so the, the purpose of developing a trail like the historic streets of North Adelaide is not just to say, look at this building, look at that building, look at that one, isn't that nice? But to say, if you, if you follow these streets with this guide, you will get an understanding of how society worked up in, in, over a period of, of more than 100 years. And you'll understand how place and property uh, inter intersected. Um, and why was it that so many people lived in humble cottages, not just to service the rich who lived in the, the mansions, but because they could walk to work. And so before the trams um, came, and it, was, it had to be a very much a, a walking city. <clears throat> so that's what we did. In, as, that's an example of how we are developing this heritage tourism program. Um, and I should say something about it. It's very important that we're not saying that heritage tourism is a particular kind of tourism. Uh, if you want to see trees, go and see trees. But if you want to see historic buildings, come to the National Trust. What we've tried to do is to, is to identify places that people will already want to go for other reasons and to make the passage along that route um, full of heritage information and education um, as well. And I won't have time to go through all of these. But we did nine different trails, all thematically linked. Um, and in each case, we've taken a place that people already wanted to go, and then said, how can you have a heritage experience as well as other kinds of experiences along the route. So the Brasa Valley, we know, is an important tourist destination. <coughs> um, from my house, I can take the Gaula Bypass and be at Seppelsfield in 51 minutes. But that's not a very interesting or educational way to go. If I started at Beaumont House and went to Hondorf and then to Birdwood, and then to Cullen Grove and Angiston, I'm following the route taken by German settlers as they made their way to the Barossa. The historic force that made the Barossa what it was, was that German settlement. And the, the story of the intersection of the planting of the vines and the people like Angus who sponsored the German immigrants and the immigrants themselves who planted the first vines. Um, and to give them a different vision, Hondorf is a place is incredibly popular with tourists. The Hondorf Arms Hotel has two business cards only. One's in English, the other's in Mandarin. Uh, and it's full of people, mostly Chinese tourists, uh, eating gigantic plates of meat and, and holding great steins of beer. And the sort of beer stopping, shoots and fets and lederhosen uh, wearing vision of, of Hondorf is just so far removed from the historical reality of the forces that many of these immigrants come to and, and, uh, and, and climb on. So try and say, here's a different way to get to the Barossa Valley, and you'll find out where it goes. And you'll go to Colin Grove, and you'll go up Mangles Hill, you'll see the Barossa Valley, because a lot of people who go the other way say, where, where's the valley? Where, where does it stop? But if you go up there, yeah, there is the, the Barossa Valley. And it's just a wonderfully rich. Um, but the two of the ones that are <clears throat> most interesting from a geographical point of view are secrets of the Coorong and Limestone Coast, um, because there it, it really is, that coastline, including the Coorong and then down the Limestone Coast, uh, is at, right at the intersection of vast geological forces that were at work over eons. So that's the idea behind this, to knit these things together. And the other one is very ambitious, one, the geological spine of South Australia, 
from Admiral's Arch in Flinders Chase on Kangaroo Island. And this whole great range runs all the way up to Ardmarula. Um, and uh, if you're going, if you were going to the Flinders Ranges and had some time, this is it's just the best way to go. And you, you start and you get to see Kangaroo Island, which more and more people want to see. Um, you pass through McLaren Vale, you pass through the Adelaide Hills, you follow on up, you don't go the Port Wakefield Road, and you don't go the Broken Hill Road, you go up the middle through Clare Valley and Laura um, and, and the towns up until um, you get to the Flinders Ranges, where you get the story of Goiter's Line, um, and you get the story of failed agriculture, you get the story of Aboriginal survival of the Ajnama people um, who inhabited and still inhabit that uh, interesting part of the world. And you do this without sacrificing any of the scenery or scenic advantages or um, other kinds of tourism you might be doing along the way. You can combine it with the Riesling Trail and in Clare, you can do other things, but along the way you are getting an education in the forces that made places and the landscape uh, what they are today. So that's that's what we've been doing with the National Trust, and uh, I've run out of time. <laughs>